Welcome to Conversations with Nicole. I am Nicole Everett, and today we're here at Martha Restaurant, and we're talking about foster care resources. I have the project manager of My Jump Vault, Mr. Thomas Fair, with me. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you, Nicole. Pleasure to be here. So tell me about My Jump Vault. What do you want to know? What does it do? Who is it for? And how does somebody get involved with it? What does it do? So what it does is it gives the foster youth and the caregivers instant access to their resources while they're transitioning in and out of care. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that, uh, let's say, for example, you're a foster parent. When a kid comes into your home, what is that youth allergic to? What's their medication background? Do you have all the doctors? you need to get that kid into school the next day and then furthermore pushing forward from there is let's say the youth is a you know a big sports player for example so let's say like my brother Mike he went around to 40 different homes if he's going from sport to sport to sport the first thing he needs before he can touch a mound the field sports. is to have that physical mm -hmm. and if you don't have a physical you can't play that sport for a lot of kids in foster care it comes times to where uh, let's say I don't, you know, I don't really make friends. Let's say going from home to home, and it's so hard being taken away that it's so easy getting to that uh, that different crowd. And uh, what we want to do is make sure that they can actually have all the documents they need at their fingertips. And even when a kid ages out, let's say at 18 going to 23, there might be times when he needs services or getting into college. Or let's say, for example, like me, when I try to join the military, that's my 10 years of past history, all the places I lived at, all the schools I went to, people that could vouch for my character. In that instance, a kid, instead of having to go to a, uh, do a documents request from the CBC, for example, or from the state, they can instantly go into this program and get all, all the information they need. Excellent. Yeah. So how was it started? How was it started? So uh, we started by making it to where youth could actually get the right to have access to the records. So okay. believe it or not, back in the day, uh, the youth never even had a right to actually have access to the records. Really? And so even, even though they were legal? Even though it was theirs. Okay. Right? So wow. it's like me telling my mom, hey mom, I need my birth certificate. Sorry, you can't have this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we made it to where it was the right, but still it had to go to a documents request where that would take 30 to 60, 90 days, mm -hmm. and then it was redacted. So you really want to get all the information you actually needed. Gotcha. And sometimes when you do a documents request, you might not even, you know, I might request, hey, I have my physical, but that physical might not be, even be in there. Mm -hmm. Right? So. Uh, we wanted to make sure the youth can get all this information at their fingertips mm -hmm. and so after we went through that process we were like let's put it up in the sky and let's start a big bin and uh, we um, designed it with youth other youth that's inside the foster care okay. system independent living specialists and judges had like a round table like this so you were on the you were on that design team yes ma'am okay and around when team. was that this was probably about four years ago okay yeah we noticed the need that uh, not only this uh, you know, the youth, but also the caregivers and everyone else needs to have access to this other types of information. Now, was this unique to the state of Florida? Yes, this is unique to the state of Florida. So, okay. with um, we started out here. Right now, we are going across the state, making it accessible to all foster parents and caregivers. Okay. But we are on the verge of pushing that nationwide. And how would a foster care provider or foster parent get access to the so yeah. what they need to do is, a, is, a, is a foster parent they need to talk to their foster parent or management team. So they're normally at every CBC, like let's say here locally, it's called Big Ben Community Based Care or Children's Home Society. Okay. They would go speak to the foster home management and they would guide them on how to get access to this program. Okay, excellent. Yeah. But it, hopefully, it's sure to be automatic, where a case manager is the one going to them. They're the ones them to giving them the information. Right, right, That's right, right. Okay. As project manager, tell me a little bit about what you do. Well, uh, it's about what I don't do. Um, everything, <laughs> okay. everything involved in the project is what we actually put our hands on. So sometimes it might be, hey, we need to do design, or sometimes a testing, or it might be marketing, or it might be customer um, intervention and services. Everything that we actually need to focus on at the time is what we actually do. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a break here. All right. But when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the app and a little bit more about you. All right, cool All thing. Right. I'm ready. Stay tuned for more conversations. This portion of Conversations with Nicole is sponsored by Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare.
Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we're here at Masa Restaurant and we're talking foster care resources with Mr. Thomas Fair of My Jump Vault. He is the project manager. So Thomas, you were telling Nicole. us about the things that you do and that you don't do as project manager. Right. Um, but let, let's talk a little bit about you. What so, do you want to know about me? I'm an open book. All right. Well, that's good yeah. to know. So you were you were in the foster care system. I was okay. in the foster care and the juvenile justice system. Okay. Growing up. In. And what was that experience like for you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it would take more than ten minutes to discuss that experience. Okay. It was a uh, how do you say that? Is what made me who I am today. Hmm. That'd be the best way to sum it up. Okay. So uh, I think that for anybody that goes through these types of experiences, it's definitely traumatizing. Mm -hmm. But uh, if they embrace it and then you know get the right resources in the mm -hmm. community and learn to uh, leverage their skills in the right area, I think that they can actually become out of a positive situation like what myself and Mike is actually. Yes. Yeah, so your experience actually makes you uniquely qualified to do what you do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Not only do we know the business side of what we do, we also know the personal side. So instead of someone coming, let's say you might not have any idea what foster care is, but you're out here, hey, this sounds like a good idea, I should do this. Well, whenever we take a look at it, we're like, all right, well, this might be a good idea, but this is exactly how it's actually going to impact it mm -hmm. on a personal level and on a business level. So we have that unique um, qualification that other people really don't have. Right. Now, were you in the Tallahassee area the whole time that you were in foster no, care? No, I moved around all the okay. time. I, right. I have a twin brother. We were also <laughs> separated for about four years. Okay. Uh, I came to Tallahassee around right when I was about to turn 17, okay. and then it's been my home ever since. Gotcha. What keeps yeah. you here? Family. I Family. mean, so, uh, and also it's the capital. So whatever we want to do. Anything we want to go through, it always has to go through the capital. Mm -hmm. But what I mean by family is that I have some people that when I met from 17 is even to now, and you even know a couple of my mm -hmm. people that I have, I friends and family. Uh, you know, they are family is more than blood. It's all about people that want to be involved in your life, want to see where you're going to go, and, and I have that established you, sure. here, that yeah. big support system. Mm -hmm. as well. Very good, very good. Now you also have a business called mm -hmm. Made by Us. Yes, ma'am. Tell me about that. Well, it's made by us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's another so, foster care resource. Yes, it's, right? a, it's a foster care resource. So what we do is, uh, what I identified was that my brother Mike and I, we've been working since we were 16. You know, full time employment all the way through. But what we found out when we started doing some of our legislative efforts was that a lot of foster kids don't have any type of employment whatsoever mm -hmm. um, by even the time they're 23. So 23 years old, average foster child coming out, 15% have a full-time job and only 35% have a part-time job. Now if you, if I don't know, 23 years old, if you only have a part-time job, what, is that, what does that result in? It results right. in homelessness, you're getting back incarcerated or mm -hmm. something like that. So right. we started out trying to focus on giving youth employability type opportunities. Okay. And then we've also, when I aged out of foster care, what actually got me involved in the foster care system was that a lot of my fellow brothers and sisters started becoming homeless after they aged out at the age of 16. And they started coming and asked for some assistance. And so who, who better to ask than big brother Thomas and big brother John. All right. And uh, so we started bringing them to our own home. And since then oh, wow. we've probably brought in about 60 different youth into our home to help them transition. And throughout that time, we've also noticed that if this is just happening here locally, imagine what's happening on the statewide level. Mm -hmm. So on the statewide level, we uh, found out that you know there's a lot of different resources that was still lacking, mm -hmm. and we've actually helped extend Foster Care 21, made it eligible to where uh, kids can actually get a driver's license. So wow. for example, when kids were 18, only like one to two percent had a driver's license in Florida. Mm -hmm. Now we're actually ramping that up. Uh, so we're just going to keep going and going, and that's what yeah. Maybus does. It really helps bring the youth in, it helps them with transitional living, helps them get employment, and it also helps them with being an advocate for themselves by expressing their story to the people that need to be, they need to hear it, that's going to make those different decisions to improve their life. Very good. That is exciting. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share these foster care resources, and I wish you all the success in the future. Well, thank you, Nicole. It's a pleasure to be here, and I wish you all the success with your program. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Stay tuned for more conversations. out of the system, within the first three years, I ate, uh, went homeless, and when I went homeless, I really... This portion of Conversations with Nicole is sponsored by Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare. On today's 
CWM Medical Moment. We're here at Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare with Dr. Wayne Batchelor, and we're talking about hypertension. Welcome, Dr. Batchelor. Good morning. So, hypertension, what is it? Hypertension is an elevated blood pressure. This is when the vascular system is subjected to too high of a pressure over a long period of time and can lead to damage of certain organs. The brain, especially, heart, kidneys, and eyes, and other organs can be affected by this condition over time. Okay, and how do people find out that they have hypertension? It's pretty simple. You can go to your, your uh, physician's office and if you have repeated measures of an elevated blood pressure, generally speaking over 140, over 90, but that somewhat depends on age and other factors, or you measure it at home when you're resting comfortably and it's mm -hmm. continually elevated, that's a sign that you may have to get that looked into further. Okay, are there any ethnic groups that are disproportionately affected by hypertension? Yes, it turns out that African Americans are more likely to have hypertension, mm -hmm. but not only are they more likely to have the condition, they're more likely to be affected by the complications of the condition. Mm -hmm. So for the sa same elevation in blood pressure, African Americans are more likely to end up with kidney disease and, and oh, sometimes wow. end-stage kidney disease where they re require dialysis. They're more likely to have strokes and other effects of that same level of elevation in blood pressure. Okay. Hispanics are also a little higher than um, Caucasians to have uh, hypertension. Okay. And what are some treatments for this condition? Well, the most important thing is are the simple things. Mm -hmm. uh, diet, exercise, mm -hmm. weight control. Diet's really important, um, especially uh, keeping your sodium levels to an appropriate uh, low level. The Western diet tends to be rich in sodium and fat and other things that are maybe not so good for mm -hmm. us. So uh, exercise, diet, and weight loss has been shown to partially reduce blood pressure in certain patients. And then many patients, unfortunately, do need to be put on medications, but they shouldn't feel that this is a problem. Mm -hmm. Your blood vessels don't care whether you're on medications, they just care that they're subjected to a low blood pressure over time. So if you have to be on one, two, or three, or more blood pressure medications, it's okay. It's just the, the key is to get the blood pressure controlled. Got it. Any tips that you give to my viewers in closing about hypertension? Well, recognize your risk factors, not only hypertension, but your other risk factors for developing heart disease and stroke. Family history, smoking, sedentary state, being obese, mm -hmm. diabetes, these are all really important uh, things for you to know, uh, including your cholesterol level. And then talk to your doctor about whether or not you need to have your blood pressure treated or other risk factors for heart disease and stroke. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay tuned for more conversations. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that medical moment with Dr. Batchelor. We are here at Massa Tallahassee and we're talking foster care resources. My special guest is Mr. Mike Williams, the Director of Youth and Community Services for the Florida Coalition for Children. Welcome, Mike. Hello, Nicole. Glad you're here. So tell me Thank what you. you do over at the Florida Coalition for Children. Well, uh, as you said, my position is the Director of Youth and Community Service. Uh, currently, we're working on a new youth project uh, implementing across the state called One Voice Impact. Okay. Impact standing for Innovative Music, Performance, Arts, Athletics, and Citizenship Training. That's a mouthful. Uh, so it's, yes, a mouthful. Okay. It's a new approach the state has taken to really investing into the youth um, through the state. Okay. And so I'm over the whole program that we'll be implementing soon, starting January 2018. Okay, and this is Foster? Yes, children. for yes for kids and that are receiving services from the system, but as well for the community. But our focus will be the foster care system. Okay, and what is your role in terms of what you do with this new initiative? So my role is um, I'm designing the whole program, putting okay. together, developing it all, um, contacting different communities, um, in which we'll launch local chapters. Mm -hmm. So our thing is we really want to launch chapters throughout the state that really give uh, the youth an engaging environment to connect in. And then we'll host quarterly camps throughout the year that allow them to come from around the state and connect with each other throughout the state. Excellent. So it's a lot of just networking, connecting communities together. Excellent. So what types of programs can the youth expect to participate in? Um, well, our most uh, recent program that's coming up um, is called the Ambassador Program. Okay. So we'll be bringing up five kids from each of our lead agencies around the state um, to really get an experience of what it's like at the Capitol, get an experience of that, the governor's mansion, and just the whole process of advocacy and what it means to share your voice and be able to network with legislators and state senators. Okay, excellent. Now you have your own project that you have launched, yes, which is My Jump Start yes. in the Real World. So yes, my jump start as well. Okay, and tell me about that. So my jump start to the real world was a program uh, that I designed about a year and a half ago. Um, when, I, when I came out of the system, 
within the first three years, I ate, uh, went homeless. Okay. And when I went homeless, I really started thinking about, you know, all the factors that ended up making me lose my job, making me, you know, become to the bottom. And so I started thinking about kids that came out of the system, and I wanted to create an experience that could really give them um, a simulation of what real life looks like, mm -hmm. so that when they transition out, they didn't have to really face the same factors that I faced. And um, they can have a jump start on their life and be able to know what it's like to be an adult. I love it. I love it. So, yes. what is what types of activities do you do with the children? Uh, so it's kind of broken down into two parts. We consider a morning session, afternoon session. Okay. The morning consists of four workshops. Uh, we have True Colors, um, which engages kids in self-awareness so really exactly their strengths of their self and others so it helps them better connect as you know technology is taking away communication mm -hmm. um, so able to connect then we have financial literacy um, job skills um, workforce development things like that wow so do you have some partners that help you out with that yes it really takes a whole community for the program to be a success so it's a lot of the community that really engages what are your what are some of your needs as it relates to my jump start I would say mm -hmm. some of my most uh, Recruited needs would be uh, the, more of the community to be involved because as I say, the day is a really interactive experience. So in the afternoon, they go through a real life simulation. So they actually have to go get house, go get cars, and make financial decisions we would as an adult. And so you think about that, we bring a different perspective. Rather than just being a regular program that we may host ourselves, we really want the community involved. So Geico, anybody who's a part of the community who wants to be involved, that they can actually exchange a financial um, service with um, and get benefit from, we want to be involved. And as well, they have success coaches who help them throughout the day. So, you know, a lot of kids don't know how to create a budget, don't know how to manage that. And so we partner with FSU, um, the University of Social Work right now, uh, looking to partner with FAMU soon. Um, but as well, anybody in the community who wants to be a part of that day um, can be a success coach and really help a kid go through the day as an adult. Excellent, excellent. We're going to take a break right now, but when yes, we come back, we will talk a little bit more about my jump start in the real world. All right. Okay. Stay tuned for more conversation. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we're here at Monster Tallahassee and we're talking foster care resources with Mr. Mike Williams. So Mike, before yes. the break you were telling me about My Jump Start in the Real World, which is an, an, an organization that you started to help foster care you know, understand what it's like to be in the real world. Yes, ma'am. Now, you also were in foster care, correct? Yes. Okay, tell me a little bit about that experience. Um, well, as Thomas said, it's definitely a long experience to talk about. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I highlight my story really, because I, I was one of the kids that came into the system as a teenager and was really angry when I came in. Um, I felt like I wasn't supposed to be taken. So I endured about 40 homes, um, or I would say more than 40 homes. Wow. I don't have the exact amount mm -hmm. um, in about two, two plus years. And so that, that ended up becoming, you know, my case file and what I was uh, accustomed to be until I actually found my family about 14, 15. Gotcha. And then I had to age out at 18. Um, okay. So I went through the whole system six years. And you've been in Tallahassee for how long? Well, this last time I've been in Tallahassee about three years, but on and off for about at least eight years okay. since I was 18. All right. And what keeps you here? Uh, now, actually, um, this is the capital of Florida, so being that I'm the director of youth and community service, uh, all the legislators, senators here, but Florida Coalition for Children um, is based here, and um, this is where we can make a lot of connections, you know, with the community um, on the state level, and we're trying to make an impact across the entire Florida. Are there any other foster care resources that you want my viewers to be aware of? Um, one Voice Impact, just uh, definitely be looking forward um, to that coming out January 2018. Okay. Uh, Florida Coalition or Florida you can find more information. Um, but we haven't really got it all together yet, so it will be upcoming within the next few months. So Everything still in the, the planning stages. Yes. Good deal. So what, is, what inspires you? Honestly, um, just as so many, I see so many families and so many kids out here. Um, I wouldn't say making, they're definitely making bad decisions, but just lost in the moment and don't know how to win um, life and what I consider it. And I feel like when I got a mentor, that's what really gave me a different perspective um, because it was someone who really was holding me accountable for everything. And so I really just wanted to um, give more of myself to the kids and let them know what I've been through, everything I've experienced, that they can really do more with their life um, if they start earlier. Um, as you know, it's a lot of kids out here succeeding at nine, 10 years old. So teenagers, I feel like, should definitely be on it even more. And so I try to just uplift them and take, get them to take the next step. If you were to give some advice to a child in the foster care system, what would you tell them? Um, believe in yourself uh, first. Um, 
well, most importantly, believe in God. Um, have a higher belief in something that can definitely help you get through the system. Um, and then set goals for yourself. Take control of your life. Um, don't wait for nobody to hand nothing to you and go get it. There's a lot of opportunities out there to make it happen. What What are some of the challenges that some of the youth face that you observe um, in the foster care system? Uh, currently today, um, I think the biggest challenge is holding their self accountable. Because um, often in the system, as we're so angry and frustrated, we want everybody to do something for us, or some of us want to do it ourselves. And then so whenever they get in the mix of just doing it themselves so much that they don't want nobody else to help them. And so they never let anybody else to tell them anything, show them anything, and it really holds them back from being the best they can. So just being open-minded um, about life, open-minded about a different way of life that you are accustomed to. Um, and then housing. I would say housing. housing. When kids come out of the system, really, uh, we definitely need a lot of assistance with the housing from our communities, mm -hmm. um, with putting them in the right environment so that they can thrive. A lot of them want to do it, but just aren't surrounded around those people that can help support them. Gotcha, gotcha. So um, these resources definitely extend beyond the when they age out, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and that can be critical in terms of them being successful mm -hmm. in life, right? Yes. Yeah. So independent living is what we consider it when they okay. are about to age out. It's very critical because um, they have so much support before 18, but when they get after 18, they have no support um, most of the time, or they don't want the support. So then they're just out there by themselves. And as you know, a young adult out here in the community can be hard trying to conquer life. Right. So thank you, Mike. I'm going to be looking to hear more from you on my jump start to the real world in yes, the future. All yes, right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, that is all the conversations we have time for today. As you can see, our food is here. We want you to tune in with us next time on Conversations with Nicole. Now, through October 4th, mention you saw Masa on Conversations with Nicole and receive 10% off your purchase. Masa is located at 1640 North Monroe Street in Tallahassee. We'd like to thank our guests, Thomas Fair of My Jump Vault and Mike Williams of My Jump Start to the Real World for sharing their experience and knowledge on foster care resources. Join us next week at Paisley Cafe for a conversation on economic opportunity and prosperity with Cara Palmer Smith of Career Source Capital Region and Al Latimer with the Tallahassee Leon County Office of Economic Vitality. I am Nicole Everett. This is Conversations with Nicole. We'll see you next time. About foster care resources, and I have a special guest, Mr. Mike Williams, the Director of Youth Services with the Florida. Council of Children. No. <laughs> <laughs>